Be'ezat Hashem, Na'ase V'Natzliach. I'd like to welcome you to the Lighthouse Project as we start a brand new series, Spiritual Preparation for the Month of Av. You know, we've been doing this series every single time that there's an important event in the year, an so important holiday, an important month. It's always good to be prepared for it or at least to find out about it. It's like that next year, you're already in that mindset. Um, before we get started with this very special series uh, that is probably going to lead us to another series which will be spiritual preparation for the month of Elul and also spiritual preparation for Rosh Hashanah and then we'll continue to Yom Kippur and the Sukkot and, Mat- and then the Hoshana Rabbah and uh, Matan Torah and not Matan Torah, um, Simchat Torah these are all days that if you get plugged in the right way there's incredible benefits but for this class, we're going to start with the month of Av. Before we get started with the class, I'd like to give an honorable mention uh, to our sponsors. Our learning is dedicated for the Refuah Shalem of Menachem Mendel Ben Batya and Devor Fega Bat Rezo. Also, uh, this particular class, Baruch Hashem, has its own sponsors. We have the Yisachar and Zevulun sponsorship from our good friends, uh, this is uh, already going on the second year. H&M Builders doing this in memory of their grandfather in honor of the Dornbush family. Yeah, that's a shame that the entire Dornbush family have a lot of atzacha and all they do in their businesses and their personal life and their business life. Yeah, that's a shame that family can grow more and more with more marriages, with more children. And yeah, that's a, shame, a lot of simcha v'atzlacha. Uh, also, I'd like to give an honorable mention to my good friend Mario that just walked in, as well as to a righteous woman from the East Coast, a good friend that's also been sponsoring this for a very long time, uh, Esther Buton, who's doing this in honor of her sons, Yonatan, Michael, Eliyahu, and Shalom ben Esther. Be'ezat Hashem, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu bless that family with bracha, atzlacha, and that gomala mala ba'avodat Hashem, that they have uh, all their heart's desires filled b'birkot ha'torah, and the Be'ezat Hashem also we hear Besorot Tovot for each one of them. We also have two additional sponsors. We have Guy Mordechai, a good friend of mine from Colorado. Uh, always a nice surprise to see his name over here. This tzaddik is doing this to Le'ilui Nishmat for the spiritual elevation of his amazing grandparents, Zohara and Mordechai Monsenego. What a tzaddik. Look at this, his grandparents passed away and he's still making sure that the Divrei Torah are elevating them in the Shemaim. Also, for Nachum and Osnat Mordechai, his other grandparents, we love and miss you very much. It's beautiful. And may Hashem give my brother Sharon the patience and strength to continue teaching. <laughs> nice. Hazak. <laughs> I love you, guy. Be'ezat Hashem, you have a lot of bracha v'atzacha in all you do, sh'tatziach b'tshuvatcha, be'ezat Hashem, a lot of bracha v'atzacha to you, v'akol ha'nilvim alecha, and be'ezat Hashem ta'alem ma'ala ma'ala b'ruchaniyut v'bagashmiyut. Also, for Sandy Maman, doing this, doing this for the le'ilui nishmat of Alen Ochana Zichonon Avacha, in honor of his yurt site. Beautiful. Another Jew taking care of another Jew that passed on. May all these divrei Torah bring a big spiritual elevation to everyone that needs it, and this should also be to the Hatzlacha of Simcha Batshula in her upcoming uh, nine month of pregnancy, and should also be to the Ilu Nishma of my grandparents. All right, let's get started. Tonight's lesson is the first installment of spiritual preparation for the month of Av. The month of Av is the month of decreased happiness. You know, we have a different month, the month of Adar. That was the, that's the month of increased happiness. This month that's coming upon us this Friday, Be'ezrat Hashem, it says, When the month of Av enters, we diminish our joy. We decrease our happiness. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you guys a joke. It says, Whenever 
Av comes in, we decrease in joy. We know the word Av also means father in Hebrew. So there's a story of a kid, he's a troublemaker. All day long, he's playing in the house, he's not listening to his mom, and he, he's, you know, he's uh, going, making a lot of noise, and going inside, outside, she, just not listening. And as soon as his father rolls up to the driveway, and he opens up the car door, and he opens up the, uh, he come, wants to come into the house, the kid starts to behave, and he starts to listen. So his mom is asking, what's going on? What's going on? How come you're uh, behaving and acting so differently now that your father is here? So he says, <laughs> So, the month of Av, it's good, they say it's good to get the milta de bdichuta, it's good to get the, the joking out of the way. However, this is a very serious subject. They should speak to the core of us. In the month of Av, that again, we're in the month of Tammuz, Av is just in a few days. Why do we diminish in our happiness? Why does our happiness have to be on a lower level? The plain, simple answer is, it's always been a terrible month for the Jewish people. Throughout Jewish history, this month has been probably the worst. You should know that right now we're in a small spiritual envelope that is part of a larger spiritual envelope. Right now we're in between the time of the 17th of Tammuz, Shvasa Betamuz, to Tisha B'Av. It's a three week period called Ben HaMetzarim. Now these I appreciate that. You should be in the Simcha now. <laughs> yes. You can see that they're performing the Halakha, that for a wedding, you're allowed to do it during Ben HaMetzarim. Because typically, that we, we, we don't do... Uh, we're in a morning state, but we'll get to that. So now, <laughs> this particular time, this envelope is called Ben HaMetzarim. But like I said, there's a much larger envelope that we're in of Shiva Sar Betamuz until after Sukkot, Hoshana Rabbah. And basically, we, for those who are in the know, the Teshuvah process, the Teshuvah season has started. It leads you from Tammuz to Av, and you'll see that there's a journey, there's a spiritual journey that we're on that leads you to Elul, leads you to Yom Adin, leads you to Yom Kippur, leads you to a brand new year, Rosh Hashanah, then we have Sukkot, then we have Simchat Torah, then we have Rosh Hashanah Rabbah, and then on the last day, the Shemini Atzeret, when the tickets are actually stamped, where Hashem says everything has been decreed, go carry it out. So that's the larger envelope that we're in. It just started. The smaller envelope is Shvasa Betamus to Tisha B'Av in a time period called Ben HaMetzarim. Now, during this time, we act as if we're in mourning. You should know that in this, these few weeks that we're in right now, we refrain from eating meat. Typically in the week of Tisha B'Av especially, we don't eat meat. We don't drink wine. We don't do seudot. We don't do weddings, right? On the week of Tisha B'Av, no. But over here you see there's custom some people do, some people don't. Over here you can see the shul, they have a custom that, because why, for a wedding, it's a first... Uh, the first mitzvah is piriya virivya, is to procreate. We don't break that for anything. We don't break that for anything. Very few things we stop weddings for. And on the week of Av, of Tisha B'Av, there's some that don't even take showers. And on these days we even fast. On the 17th of Tammuz we fast, on Tisha B'Av we fast. And anytime we fast, we put our bodies to physical torment in order to connect to, to a bitter time. And that's the times that we're in right now. Some people just walk through these three weeks like it's nothing. But people that are in the know, these are not easy weeks. These are also not very easy months. And the reason for it is for the events that happened during this time. So let's find out. Let's get some history. What happened on the 17th of Tammuz 
And what happened on Tisha B'Av? These are two dark days in Jewish history. What happened? So, five and five. I'll mention a few. On the 17th of Tammuz, surrounded, surrounded. that's one of them. But before that, that was when the Jewish people created the golden calf. The Egel, that whole scenario happened when? On the 17th of Tammuz. On that same day, Moshe Rabbeinu came down and smashed the Luchot. Same day, 17th of Tammuz. In the time of Bet HaMikdash, we used to have an offering called the Tamid. The Tamid means it's one that we bring always, every day. It's Korban Tamid. We start bringing the, the Korban Tamid on that day. Also, like our good friend said over here, the walls of Jerusalem got breached. You know, the, the, it's a fortified city. A fortified city back in the days, uh, there's no better. It's the top of the line. It, it's a metropolis. It also serves as a protection. The walls of Jerusalem got breached on Shiva Sebet Tammuz. That means enemies were standing outside of Jerusalem wanting to hurt us, the Jews, and they succeeded to break that wall on this day. Also, we had an evil man by the name of Opostomos who took a Torah scroll and burnt it in Bet HaMikdash. Furthermore, in Bet HaMikdash, they took an idol and they put it inside the Hechal. Could you imagine? The holiest place of all in Am Yisrael. Here comes an idol and they put it right in the center. Welcome. So that was the 17th of Tammuz. Shvasa Bet Tammuz. Tragic events. We move on to the next one. Tisha B'Av. The 9th of Av. The darkest day in history. As a matter of fact, it's the original 9-11. Av is one month before Elul. Elul is the last month of the year. So that's 12. Right before it is 11. Tisha B'Av, 9-11. It's the original 9-11. Next week we will go into detail about all that. But for right now, what happened on this dark day? Well, first, that was the day... That the spies, the Meraglim, came back from Israel and spoke Lashon Hara. They spoke badly about the Holy Land. Something that is, you can't even wrap your, your head around it. I don't know how it's even possible. But both the first Bet HaMikdash and the second Bet HaMikdash all got destroyed on that day. What's the chances that something like that can happen? Both Bet Mikdash Rishon Vesheni got destroyed on Tisha B'Av. The city of Betar was captured by the Romans on Tisha B'Av. We'll go a little bit further into recent history. We have the expulsion of Jews from, from England. In the year of 1290, happened in Tisha B'Av. The Spanish Inquisition started in 1492 on Tisha B'Av. World War I started in Tisha B'Av. The first mass roundup of trains that went directly to the concentration camps into guest chambers was Tisha B'Av. It's a dark day in history. And many, many more that are not mentioned, by the way. These are very, very harsh times in Jewish history. You should know that the months of Tammuz and Av are months that belong to Esav. Esav is an arch nemesis. He is our enemy. Esav sonet Yaakov. It's a halakha. It's a halakha. You open up a halakha. How to do netilat yadaim? What bracha you say on fruit? You go, you flip the pages. Esav sonei Yaakov. It's a halacha. Wait, 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 wait. Say it again. Say, there's a halacha yeah. that Esav hates Yaakov. But what prayer you say on fruit? That's not. not no. no, meaning when you open up Shulchan Aruch, the 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 book of of how to govern yourself, right. which bracha to say, how do you do netilat yadaim? What's the right way to get dressed? 
How do you light Shabbat candles? What are you allowed to do on the holidays? The Shulchan Aruch. You'll find over there, Halakha, Esav Sonei Yaakov. Out of nowhere. But as a Jew, you should know that. And this Esav, who represents Edom, who represents his, his governing uh, a minister or angel in the Shemaim, is the Yetzirah himself, the devil, is the one that represents him has influence and power over two months of the year. As a matter of fact, he had three, but he lost Elul. We got Elul back. But there's two months in the year that belong to Esav and to Yetzer and that's Tammuz and Av. We are right now in Tammuz. By Friday, Be'ezat Hashem, it's going to be Av. So that means that Esav has more powers during this time. The Yetzer has more powers during these months. And typically has more influence. So if that's the case, you got to be on the defense. This is not the time where you challenge Esav or the Yetzirah. These are months of very strict judgment. And they're not very favorable for the Jews. These are the months when you stay in a very low profile. Especially these three weeks. The deen, the strict judgment, is prevalent during these months and during these weeks. And Chazal warn us, during these weeks, don't go to court. You're going to lose. Don't go to court. If you have a court date, push it off. Postpone it. Uh, if you remember in Adar, what do we say? If you have a court date, go on Adar. Yeshanu mazal. Yeshanu mazal bari. A healthy uh, luck in, uh, in Adar. This is the complete opposite. Don't go to court. Don't open up a new business. Don't, uh, don't start any new endeavors. Lay low. They even tell us not to go outside between the hours, between the sixth and ninth hour of the day, which typically is like early to late afternoon. Because that's when the dean is like completely rampant. And there are certain menacing angels that if they have the right candidate, they can hurt a person. Lay low. Are you talking about these three weeks or the entire month of Av? Right now I'm talking about Ben Amit Sarim, these three weeks. Right now we're talking about between Shvaz Tamuz and the ninth of Av. We are smack in the middle. Half is behind us, we got half to go. As a matter of fact, the word of the month, the name of the month is Av, which is spelled out Aleph and Bet. And the rabbis tell us, that why is it uh, spelled out Aleph and Bet? Because the first half is Arur, cursed. The second half, Baruch, blessed. So typically, Av has a split energy. Up until the middle of the holiday, uh, up until the middle of the month, don't do anything. Just lay low. Just, you know, low profile. Right after Tu Be'av, on the 15th of Av, that's the, the lover's day, the day of love. They have, uh, what do you call that day? Uh, Valentine's Day. Our Valentine's Day is Tu Be'av. The best day that we could have. The best. One of the greatest holidays. Coming up in a few weeks. Becomes Baruch. From Tu Be'av and on, Start business, go back, go do, uh, go meet, go start. So the first half is cursed, the second half is, ba is Baruch, Av, Aleph Bet. And we can learn this also from God's name of the month. Now anybody who's been in this class before has heard this many, many times, but we'll repeat it again. Every single month, has a special name of God. That if you know that name of God, one of God's names for that month, there's a certain time in a certain prayer that if you mention God's name, you have an open, like, like a carte blanche, to speak to God and tell Him anything you want and it's going to be heard and it's going to be accepted. Why? Because there's a pasuk that backs it up. So I'll give you the background to it, and then we'll give you some more background to it. It says, let's go to, okay, what's a Shabbat? 
So there's a perk in Tehillim that we say on Shabbat. And we also say it in Motzei Shabbat. I'll read it to you. It says, Kivi hashak v'afaletehu. Because it, it, it's, it's me that he wanted and he yearned for. V'afaletehu. And I will rescue him. Asagevehu ki adashemi. I will uplift him. I will raise him because he knows my name. He's going to call out my name and I will answer him. I'm with him when he's in trouble. I will uh, save him and I will exalt him. I will give him kavod, honor. I will give him long life. And I'll show him my salvation. He doubles up. I will give him long life and I will show him my salvation. So let's go back to the beginning of the Pasuk. It says, I'm going to exalt him. I was going to, I'm going to elevate him because he knows my name. What name is that? Well, you should know that God has many names. But we are talking about one name. There's one name that is connected to, uh, uh, to Chesed. Chesed is loving kindness to benevolence. And it's the Yud K Vav K. When you see God's name, that is the letters Yud and He, and the Vav and the He, that is God's name for 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 goodness. There's other names like Elohim, that's for Dean, Sevakot, all these different names. But the 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 the, the, the name that we're dealing with is the Yud K Vav K. And if you take that four letter name and you boggle it every single combination possible, you'll come up with twelve combinations. Typically, if you do four by four, it should be sixteen. If you do, if you, you, but the reason is that you get twelve is because there's two haze. So because there's two haze, you can only get twelve. Okay, for your mathematicians in the room. So yud k vav k. So each month has a different combination of that name. Now, when you get to the musaf of Rosh Chodesh, for those of you that go to shul or for those of you that pray musaf. And Rosh Chodesh, you get to this bracha that says, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu, Baruch Atah Hashem, Mekadesh Israel, Verashe Chodeshim. It's that blessing that says that we, we uh, sanctify the month. So the rabbis tell us, go, Baruch Atah Hashem, we get to Hashem, what do you do? You think of that Yud Kei Vav Kei combination of God's name, and you say, Mekadesh Israel, Verashe Chodeshim, that's the name for the month. Right there and there, stop. And just let it go. Just let it go. Thank God for all that He's given you. Thank Him. Give Him all the power. Give Him all the... You know, give, him, give Him your heart. Pray for anything that you want. Pray for someone else. Pray for Am Yisrael. Pray for God. Ask for it to be a free gift. And move on. And you started the month like a champion. Because you called out God's name for the month. And He heard you. Just like the Pasuk backed it up and said it. So, now that you have this background, you should know that God's name, God's name for Av, I'll give you an example. On Nisan, it's the way that it's written. Yud, K, Vav, K, which stands for Yismechu HaShamayim. Vetagel Haaretz. Easiest one to remember. It's the same order. Av is different. Av, it's He and Vav and Yud and He. Meaning you have a He in the beginning, a He in the end, and then you have the Vavs and the Yud. Let's get deep now, okay? So letters can be either uh, not feminine, but can be the feminine aspect of of God, and then there is the masculine aspect of God, of the Shekhinah. The feminine is Din, which is represented by the letter He. The masculine is represented, which is Chesed, which is goodness and kindness, by the letters Yud and Vav. So, the He's that are on the end, those are the feminine and strict. The ones that are in the middle are the Vav and Yud, and that's the masculine, and those are Chesed. So, if the, letter, if the name for God on, in Av starts with He and Vav, He is what? Strict. That means that the month is going to be strict. 
Any time that the month starts with the letter Hey in the beginning of it, the secret there, it's going to be a tough month. How does God's name start for the second half? Yud Hey. So that means, like, to back up the point that we said, the beginning of Av, strict, lay low, arur, it's a curse. The second half of God's name starts with the Yud. That means the second half is good. There's only one name per month, except for a leap year where you say all 12 names. But you just said the beginning of Av is Din, and the second end of Av is... Yes, the two letters correspond to Din, because the He is actually what corresponds to the Din. Right, so there's two names. Because you said the first half of Av is Din, and the second is... It's the one name split in two. However... We do have a, a concept what we call God Yudke. Hallelujah. Right? What's well, Hallelujah? Praise God. There's a deeper yeah. this is for a different lesson. This is the the, 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 the letters of Yud and He are the only ones that we're really using in this world right now. The He and the Vav went away since the Shekhinah left us. Uh, this too, we're getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Is that only one, one Hashem's name per month? It is one name. Because it's not one name. The first half is half of the name. And the second half is the second half of the name. But because the He, which corresponds strict judgment, is in the beginning of that name, then we know that the beginning of the month is tough. Let's not get too deep into it, but let's, I'll explain this concept a little bit more. And what's the third, uh, the 13th, uh, you said leap here? You say all 12. On the, on the leap year, you say all 12 names. Which is the first Adar? Second Adar. So the second one is the leap year? The yes. One? Yeah, the first one, we always have a first Adar. But technically, the second Adar is the new Adar because Purim is in the second Adar. So we do that to stretch it out. So, welcome. Sure, I'm pulling up a chair for her. So, now that we've spoken a little bit about We've spoken a little about uh, the name of God. You should know something else. This is also a, a very interesting thing that you should know. That the Jewish timeline is not a timeline. It's not year 1, year 100, year five, uh, 500, year 1000, year 2000. It's not one line. The Jewish year is one year that's constantly looping, constantly looping. We are constantly reliving the same 365 uh, sp a day spiral, which means these 365 days are the same days. Just whatever is happening on that day previously, we are privy to that spiritual energy. I'll explain it a little bit more. For example, Moshe Rabenu came down from Har Sinai on the third time, with the second pair of Luchot, with God's forgiveness, when? Yud Betishre, which is what? Yom Kippur. So what do we do every Yom Kippur? We check ourselves into a shul and we say, Hashem, please forgive us, please forgive us, please forgive us. Why? Because that's the day that God forgave all the Jews. So because that spiritual energy is available on that day, so every time that Yud Tishrei comes around, we tap into that energy. It's the energy of forgiveness on that day. Similarly, when there is, like for example, uh, different um, days that have this power, such as Shabbat. Why is Shabbat so unique? It has a special power, get plugged in. Another day, Rosh Chodesh. Another day, Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, Matan Torah, uh, Shavuot, the last one we just said. These are all days that if you get plugged into it, there's an abundance of spiritual energy. So Rosh Chodesh is one of those days. So Rosh Chodesh, which is happening on Friday, it's very important how you celebrate it. Why? Anything that's the Rosh, anything that's the head, everything goes according to the head. Just like Rosh Hashanah. Why did they tell us in Rosh Hashanah there's incredible things that you must do in that 48-hour period? Why? Because it determines the rest of the year. Similarly, on a monthly level, the Rosh Hashanah, the way that you uh, activate the powers on that day, is how the rest of the month is going to be. So...
we see that Av is prone to some negative energy. And we're in the midst of Ben Amitzarim, in between of Shvasa Betamuz and the ninth of Av. But let's add another layer to this story. It's not just about what happened to the Jews. It's also about the Jews. At the centerpiece of the story of Ben Amitzarim is a generation of orphaned Jews. Generations and generations and generations of orphaned Jews. And we are orphaned, we lost our biggest prize, the biggest gift that we ever got. We're lamenting, we're mourning the loss of the most prized possession, this physical apparatus in this world that gave us a direct connection to our loving God. Bet Hamikdash. A building that we can visit and atone for our sins. We're, or, we're an orphan generation. We can't understand it. We're saying it, but we will never understand it. This is a, a building where you can go and get a spiritual realignment. You can discover or rediscover your purpose in this building. Our true Jewish purpose, the one that we yearn for all the time, was available to us over there. You walk in there, you figure, you figure things out for yourself as a Jew. You know, the reason why, you know, last year my rabbi in my shul, Rabbi Sharabani, gave an unbelievable chidush. He says, why are we an orphan generation? He says, what's an orphan? An orphan is a, is a child that's never felt the hug of a mother. A, 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 an orphan is a child that never had a, a protective father over him. He'll never know what it's like to have a kiss in the middle of the night when he wakes up from a nightmare. He'll never understand what it's like to be cold and to be protected from the rain with a parent. So because he doesn't know it, he doesn't miss it. But a person who has parents, a kid that grew up with parents, he knows what it's like when a mother's not around to kiss him. He knows what it's like when he doesn't have his father that can protect him. He knows that. He misses it. Why? Because he had it. We are an orphan generation. We don't know what we're missing. We don't know that we don't have Bet HaMikdash. We don't feel it. We hear about it. We read about it. But we don't really know what it means to have a Bet HaMikdash. What's interesting though, is that it's been gone for thousands of years. I mean, practically almost every fad, every you know, thing that had some sort of relevance in this world comes and goes, comes and goes. Empires, fashion, trends, everything comes and goes. Yet, within our Jewish culture, there's one thing that doesn't come and go. And that's our yearning for Bet HaMikdash. Our crying and mourning for Yerushalayim. Look at us. It's 2,000 years later. We're in a room talking about Jerusalem. There's nobody in the world right now sitting and talking about Mesopotamia. Not only that, talking with emotions like they're missing out on something. Borderline crying over, over our history. Not only do we yearn for it, but we pray for it, we cry for it. There's not one prayer here that doesn't mention Yerushalayim, Bet HaMikdash. I mean, I can open up, the, I can open up the, the, the Sidur and give you three, four, five, ten different places where you don't realize that you're constantly praying for Bet HaMikdash. It's like, it just rolls off your tongue. Uh, I'll just give you an example. Even just as soon as we finish the Amidah, what do we say every day, every day, three times a day? As soon as we finish Amidah, We don't stop. Build it, build it, build it, build it, build it, build it. Like we're obsessed with it. Please, let's, let us have a share in your Torah. 
לעשות חוקי רצונך ולבדך ולבב שלם. I mean, I can flip to any random page, you'll see בית המקדש ירושלים. It's part of our everyday lives. The question is why? Why? Why can't we let it go? Why can't we move on? Why can't we get over that loss of a, of a building from 2,000 years ago? Why can't we get over this Chorban? Well, the simple answer is because we're still suffering from the same fate of 2,000 years ago. From the same fate that destroyed Bet HaMikdash. What was the reason of the destruction of Bet HaMikdash? Sinat Chinam. The lack of unity. The lack of Achdut. That's the cause of it all. That's the reason we've been giving. Baseless, senseless hatred to one another. Sinat Chinam. And since then, we haven't been able to fix it. Could you imagine? And we know what it is. Most people, when you tell them, the trouble, the, 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 you tell them what the problem is, they go, they fix it. We are still suffering from that same syndrome that destroyed our prized jewel, Bet HaMikdash. And you should know this lack of achdut, it's ironic because the secret of the success of the Jewish people lies in unity. The success of the Jewish people is tied into one thing, achdut. Our connection to God depends on unity. Newsflash. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Our God is one. That's it. That's it. We say it three times a day. We, we, since we're little kids, we, we, we're taught to say it. It's right there. Hashem is Echad. God is one. God is united. God is, is whole. So if you want to connect to, one, to the one that is one, what do you have to do? You have to become one with Him. That's it. That's the secret. Every day we're like, oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> you say Shema Yisrael and thinking what I'm going to do. Hashem Echad. The unity is the secret of the Jew. Now, we have not been united since the time of the destruction of Bet HaMikdash. And this time period is a bitter time period that just gives us another reminder. You still didn't get it right. You're crying over it. Like it's like this old past story. It's today. They say any generation that doesn't have Bet HaMikdash built in it, it means that it was destroyed in it. What does that mean? It means that if you didn't merit to fix it and to have Bet HaMikdash, that means you're just like them. You destroyed. If you were there, you, you, it would have been destroyed too. We're not any better. You can't look at them and say, Oh, Sinat Chinam, how could you? We're doing it now, whether it's passive or aggressive. Tisha B'Av highlights the lack of unity, the lack of achdut in the world, and in Am Yisrael. For example, I don't know if you guys follow uh, Israeli politics. I don't. But I can tell you that they have about 30 political parties. 30. The place is smaller than Jersey. They got 30 political parties. How many do we have in the United States? Two. Two. Maybe third if you independent, whatever it is. We got Democrat, Republican, and another one that never wins. They have 30. 30. I mean, how much achdut do you see there? There's so much division amongst the Jews politically, religiously, secularly. We become these pockets of sects within our Jewish identity. And if it wasn't for Chabad, I don't know how we would ever get a Yemenite, a Moroccan, an Ashkenaz, uh, an atheist French all in one room for Kabbalat Shabbat in, uh, in India somewhere. 
they, only they can pull it off and in the strangest places in the world I've never been it's almost impossible to get so many different people into one room and feel united thank God Chabad is doing that work they're succeeding in spurts where's the unity where has the unity gone where has the love gone where has the brotherly love gone what is it that we're not getting books have been written rabbis have preached shows have been made what is it Why are we constantly reliving this vicious cycle every ninth of Av? It's like, you know, people that don't want to get out, that are uh, self-destructive. They know the problem, they don't want to get out of it. And now when it's like completely highlighted, here's the problem and here's, here's the solution. Well, vicious cycle. This is the time to remember Yerushalayim. This is the time to cry for Yerushalayim. The Gemara in Ta'anit says, Anybody who mourns for Jerusalem, and I can tell you, can sit around, uh, look around the room and right now and I can tell you, shed a tear for Jerusalem, I dare you. Go ahead, try. You know how hard it is? You know how hard it is to squeeze out a tear for Jerusalem? That's how disconnected we are. Yet the Gemara tells us, if you're able to do that, when it gets built out, you'll never to see it. Look how far away we are from that. Try to cry. Try to cry. I, I appreciate that. Try to do it. Try to wake up in the middle of the night, do tikkun chatzot, and try to cry for Jerusalem. It takes a lot. It takes a lot. That's how disconnected we are from Yerushalayim and where we're at. This month just keeps reintroducing us to, or just doesn't let us forget Jerusalem and its importance to the fabric of our Jewish existence. It's always just like a reminder. You forget me? You forget me? You forget me? What do we say when we get married? What happened? Because a Jew is prone to forget Jerusalem. Some tzaddikim like you are davening, the some that are not. <laughs> However, even though in this dark time, Av is actually a very special time. Because they say the, the darker the time, the brighter the illumination that is possible. This month has tremendous potential. It all depends on what kind of vessel you are. And if you tap into it at the right time, with the right, mind, with the right mindset, you can capitalize and have a huge spiritual boost on the month of Av. Some of the best things that you can do is on Rosh Chodesh. We just spoke about it, the power of this day. So on Rosh Chodesh, it's a good way to give direction to the month of Av. Prepare yourself. Don't just walk into Minyan 20 minutes late, put on Tfilin Shema Yisrael Amida, go. Say, you know, today is a special day. Maybe I should prepare my prayer. Maybe I should have a little conversation with God today. I actually know where to stop and I know where to plug it in. That guy on Wednesday night told me. Why don't you prepare your prayer for Av and have a good connection and not for you. Not because you need it. Because we need it. Why don't you check yourself into the month of Av and pray for another Jew. For Am Yisrael. Pray for a Jew that you know and for a Jew that you don't know. As a matter of fact, to strengthen that point, did you know that Aharon Cohen died on Rosh Chodesh Av? He could have died on any day. 
Why was this blessed day of his passing on the first of Av, on Rosh Chodesh Av? What's the message here? Nothing is by happenstance. Everything has a reason. Why would a Harona Kohen that is known for Ohev Shalom, Rodev Shalom, die on Rosh Chodesh? And not only on Rosh Chodesh, Rosh Chodesh Av. Well, he had a good rep. He had an excellent reputation in Am Yisrael. Not only was he Ohev Shalom, Rodev Shalom, he loved peace and he chased peace. He also have Ohev Taberiot, Um Karvan La Torah. He used to love people. And he loved them so much, you know how he expressed his love? He would bring them closer to the Torah. That was his character. What a guy. That's Aaron Cohen. And a person who was known for Ahavat Am Yisrael, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, on that day, light a candle for that Jew. Light a candle for Aaron Cohen on Tisha B'Av. Why? To remind you, Ohev Shalom, Rodev Shalom, I love every Jew. I'm, I'm chasing peace. We know the stories. Aharon Cohen used to see two Jews fighting, not talking. He would go and tell him, you know, he loves you. He told me he loves you. He didn't say nothing. He goes to the other guy. You know, he's not even mad anymore. He's actually looking forward to meet you. He's like, oh, really? And they would come and they would meet, they would make up. He would create peace. Ohev Shalom Verodev Shalom. You'd hear a couple fighting, a husband and a wife. He was right there. Forgive him. Don't worry. You know, he'll get better. He speaks there. What are you doing? He'll go to him and tell, What are you doing? You know, you have, to be, you have to be a gentleman. You have to do this. He would make shalom between people. He says, Don't forget, Tisha Be'av, that's what you need to be. Aaron Kohen, that's the energy that we need. And since both the first and the second Bet HaMikdash got destroyed on Tisha B'Av, on the month of Av. Why? Because of Sinat Chinam. Because of Sinat Chinam. What do we have to do? The complete opposite. We have to become Aharon Kohen. We have to take upon ourselves his character for the month. Or for life. We have to bring back his energy into the world. The energy of brotherly love, seeking peace, pursuing peace, achieving peace between everyone. Between man and wife, between uh, in-laws, friends, strangers, young, old, husband, wife, all on Israel. Something very interesting about Harona Cohen. You know, there's Sefirot, the ten emanations, there's deep Kabbalah learning that we're not gonna we're not gonna do today. But just know that there are these Sefirot, these little spiritual energies that we can tap into, and each one has its own power. And the rabbis were able to give each one of these Sefirot a person that corresponds to it. Chesed. Avraham. Din, Yitzchak. Yaakov was the combination of Chesed and Din. He was Tiferet, right? Tiferet, the middle. We have Yosef. Yosef is the Yesod. We also have Netzach Vehod. Netzach is the legs. Netzach is Moshe. Hod is Aharon. That's the name of the, the, the actual Hod. Hod is uh, like comes from the word Hodaya, from uh, royal. Uh, I'll stop myself and not just like pull a rabbit out of the hat. I don't know what Hod is. I know how to explain it in my mind, but I don't know how to explain it in English. Beivrit, I hope, but a different time after class. So Hod is the fifth Sefira that corresponds to Aharon. Okay? We are right now in the fifth millennium. They call it the sixth millennium because it's 5,000 and. We're 5,778. Right? So why would the fifth millennium that corresponds to the Hod be Aharon Kohen? Because they said during that time 
during that time, the challenge of the people is going to be to be like Aharon. It's like a big sign. Be like Aharon Kohen. Like, you know, Ahavat Chinam, Oev Shalom, Rodev Shalom. That is going to be the, the mantra for this generation. Look at what Chesed God does with us. He's sending us hints all the time on how to, to be on the right path. Yet, completely on the wrong. Completely on the wrong path. And I'm speaking just for Jews. And the reason why I say we're on the wrong path is because we don't have Bet HaMikdash in our life. Ezat Hashem will merit to it. Another sign of that, a few parashiot ago, we had parashat Bilam. Bilam had a talking donkey. Very interesting thing about this talking donkey. After God created the world in six days, and right before the seventh day where He rested Shabbat, in twilight, the in-between time, you know, the times when we rush to light the candles before Shabbat comes in, and people use those 18 minutes, that's called twilight. In those, in that part of time, God said, wait, 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 I'm not done, I'm not done. Ten more things I have to create. And He created ten more things. Pia Aretz, Pia Be'er, the Aton of Bilam, and many other things. So they're saying, out of all the things, like right before, uh, right before Shabbat comes in, what was so important that Hashem needed to create this? Not only that, that He created it right before Shabbat, on the you know right between twilight. He says one of the things that we, he created was piha aretz. That's the, the mouth of the earth that opened up and swallowed up whom? Korah. Why? Because he brought conflict into the camp. He had sinat chinam on who? On Moshe, on Haron. He, he took more people around him, his cohorts. Come, let's make, let, let's make trouble. He brought machloket. So Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I need to create this. Because 2,000 years later, I'm going to need the, the, the ground to open up and swallow these people that created the Machloket for Am Yisrael. So the Ben Yishchai says, you know why, they, why HaKadosh Baruch Hu created Pi Ha'aretz? He says, because similarly, at the end of the fifth millennium, just like Yom Shishi at the end, right in the end, right before Ben Hashmashot, right before Ben Hashmashot, there's going to be what? Machloket. There's going to be ama, the people that are going to be fighting. And I have to create something for them during that time. It was also like a signal. During that time, there's going to be all these events where people are not going to get along. We're just not getting along. And we're not connecting. You know, there's some good customs to do during this time if you want to activate some, some feelings about Yerushalayim, just to wake up your heart, to say, you know, what kind of a stone heart do I have that I don't feel for Yerushalayim, that I don't feel for, for Bet HaMikdash? What do you do? You fast. Go on the 17th of Tammuz, don't eat. Feel the hunger pangs in your stomach and say, Hashem, I am not eating because I want to feel pain for Yerushalayim. Antisha Be'av, don't eat, sit on the floor, read sad stories about what happened to the Jewish people. Antisha Be'av, and start to connect. Hashem, I don't have Bet HaMikdash to bring a sacrifice for my sins. I am the sacrifice. I'm using up my body fat and my, my blood is diminishing by not taking any nutrition on this day. I'm just burning and burning and not taking anything in. I am the sacrifice on this day. Antisha Be'av, I'm fasting. Do tikkun chatzot. Wake up in the middle of the night. Wake up in the middle of the night and read four or five pages in the Sidu that all talk about the, the, the destruction of Bet HaMikdash and, and, and Yerushalayim and everything that happened there. I dare you to do it. Wake up at 2, 3 in the morning and speak to God and tell Him, I'm crying because I'm, 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 I'm sad for my people. I'm sad for you, Hashem. You don't have a That was His apartment. That was His home. That's where He lived. Real Jews that are connected can still feel that. If what I'm telling you is so far-fetched from your everyday life, you have to understand. You're just not there. Tisha B'Av is just a highlight how far you're not there. By the way, I'm speaking to myself. You think like, uh, I say Tisha B'Av and the water works, I start crying like crazy. I'm speaking for myself as well.
waking up in the middle of the night, crying about Bet HaMikdash, praying to Hashem that He will re- rebuild Yerushalayim with Bet HaMikdash HaShlishi and for Mashiach to come. You know, you have to be, a, you have to be on a certain level to, to feel like you, that really matters to you, to pray for Mashiach. You should know that Mashiach is supposed to be born in the month of Av. Guess what day? Tisha B'Av. So on Tisha B'Av, go into all the hospitals, check all the Jewish babies, and follow him until he turns into Mashiach. He's already here. Want to hear something interesting? In Hebrew, or in Judaism, in our religion, we have a thing called gematria. Gematria is a numerical value of letters. And the numerical value of letters can be used to learn something, to learn out something. So for example, if I have a certain word that has a value of 100, and I have another word that has the same value of 100, there's a correlation between them. You can connect them. Very interesting, the gematria of Mashiach, which is Mem Shin Chet, is 358. Which is the exact same gematria of the word Nachash, snake. What's the connection between Mashiach and Nachash? First of all, just the fact that, it's, that there, there's a correlation blows my mind, but there's an unbelievable connection. The Nachash is the Yetzirah. The Nachash is the devil. The Nachash is the one who is your adversary, if you don't use him properly. You have to understand, he's just an angel that's doing his job. You can turn him to be your life coach. He can be the one that just tells you what's the wrong thing to do. And as soon as he tells you to do it, you say, thanks coach, I know, not, I know now what not to do. Or you can just fall into the trap, okay, convince me. Okay, tell me, what should I do? What shouldn't I do? You play the game, you're going to lose that game. It depends on how you use it. It's either you use him to motivate yourself, to activate Kedusha out of the, the resistance that he's giving you in your life for growth, or you fall for the trap. Any way that you use your Yetzir Hara, eventually it's going to get you to the same direction. Either you succeed in your Tikkun, or you fail in your Tikkun. The Yetzir Hara is going to bring us to two places, to success or failure. So you should know, in the time of the Geula, we have that option. When Mashiach comes, we have two options. Either he comes because we succeeded, because we beat Yetzir Hara, or he's going to come because we failed and yet Sahara won. So the Nachash is necessary for Mashiach. Without the Nachash in the, in the picture, what's the, what's the Inyan of Mashiach? Everything is gravy, everything is good. The whole game over here is that there's somebody challenging you. And if you win, you merit. If you don't win, you lose. That's the game of life. Now, what happens if we lose? If we, if we win, if we do teshuva, if we unite, if we have achdut, Hashem says, oh, my children, come back to me, my children. Oh, of course, let's do this. Am Yisrael, let's unite, let's rebuild, let the whole world see the glory of Am Yisrael. Amazing. But if not, what happens? Does the angry God come and smite everyone and punish everyone, that angry old man from the sky? Is that what he turns into? No. Tell you a little secret from Amidah. This is beautiful. I heard this from Rabbi Mansur many years ago, and I love recycling it. It says, in the first Berachah of Amidah, we speak about Hashem, and then it tells that the last line says, The last pasuk, or the last sentence, in the first paragraph of Amida reads, And the Kadosh Baruch Hu brings the Savior, 
לבנה ביניהם, to the children of their children, who? We just said, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, the beginning. Baruch Atah Hashem, Elohim, Yerach HaOlam, Elohi Abraham, Elohi Yitzchak, and Yaakov. So we're going to bring to, לבנה ביניהם. He's going to bring to the children of the children of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Why is he going to bring a Mashiach, a, a Savior, to the children of the children of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov? Leman Shemo. For his namesake. And why? And why, why for his namesake? It's like this. Let's say somebody has a son. Let's say there's a rich father. He, he owns everything. Very well respected in the community. Everybody uh, bows their head, gives him respect. He, wherever he goes, he gets a lot of kavod. And he's got a son, troublemaker. And every time that this son goes somewhere, he causes trouble. And this son that's causing trouble right now is bringing a lot of shame upon him and ruining the family name. So what does the father do? He goes to where the person, uh, where his son caused trouble and he, tell, he appeases the person. I'm sorry, here's a thousand dollars. This will pay for the damage. I apologize. The other guy says, okay, no problem. He comes, he saves him again. He saves him once. The son calls another, uh, another mistake, another problem. The father goes, he says, I'm sorry. Just say, yeah. He has to save the name. What, he's going to have uh, the family name tarnished by this prodigal son? He's doing it what, for his name. So over here it says, Hashem is doing it no matter how bad we were, no matter how bad we didn't do the Geulah, He does it what? For His name's sake. Not to dirty His name. Hashem has a good name in the world. But how does He do it? You see that guy that says, I can't believe you did it again. Here's $5,000. Now I have to, pay, have to get you out of jail. Now I have to save you from this. Now I have to pay for the car. Is he that angry father? No, he gets you out of trouble. And he says, where? Be'ava. Lovingly, he will do it. So even if we don't merit to the Geulah with Achdut, he's going to do it for his namesake and with love. That's our God. That's Hashem. Deeper, deeper secret. It says, Umevi Goel. What's the word Mevi? He says, When is that Goel going to come? When is the, uh, the Mashiach going to come? He says, Mevi. What's Mevi? It says, After the four Galiot. We have uh, Mitzrayim, Babel, uh, Yavan, Edom. Those are the four Galiot. Mevi, after those four Galiot, Edom. Edom, we're in Edom right now. And they even say that there's a fifth one, Ishmael. Mem bet yudalef, but they even said that there's a fifth one, Ishmael. So mevi bet geula bet mem b'man shmo be'ava. So we see that if we merit, we bring him with chesed. If we don't, it comes through the the both ways. The geula comes. There's an interesting story of the Baal Shem Tov meeting the Mashiach. The Baal Shem Tov had a special uh, uh, skill. He was able to take his neshama, to leave his body, go to the heavens, and be in the heavens and talk to angels and, uh, and you know, have these spiritual elevations. And he was, he was able to learn, he was able to speak, he was able to meet special souls. So one time, while he's in this spiritual elevation, he meets the soul of Mashiach. He sees him, he says, oh, Mashiach. He goes, oh, Baal Shem Tov, nice to meet you. He goes, then when are you going to come? When are you going to come and save us? So Mashiach tells him, when everybody follows your learning. Now, who is the Baal Shem Tov? Baal Shem Tov is a, is a rabbi that, a, that changed the way the world practices Ahavat Am Yisrael. During the times in Europe, it was all about, you know, being strict, being stern. Uh, the Torah was not dark, but, uh, you know, a lot of rules, a lot of regulations, very restrictive. There was, it was more like a rule book than Ahava. And him and the 36 hidden tzaddikim said, we're going to go into the world and change things around. We're going to highlight the beautiful spark that's in every Jew. Because inside this body suit, we all have the same thing. You have a spark, you have a spark, you have a spark, I have a spark. We all have a little spark of Hashem. And that's what they saw. Not the exterior, what's inside, the little spark. 
So they would go and they would highlight all that's good about a Jew. Even if it was the biggest simpleton that never learned, but he was walking to Shul on Shabbat, it was the biggest thing. Oh my God, you're such a tzaddik. Even if he never learned how to read or write, but he spent his last kopel on taking his son to a cheder so he can learn out of bed, it was the biggest thing. He would highlight the, the goodness in Am Yisrael, and they started to develop this achdut, this love of Am Yisrael. So when the soul of Mashiach met the soul of the Baal Shem Tov, we tell them, when am I going to come? When the world starts to practice your, your way. Back to Achdut. In the future, this time period that we're speaking of, of Shiva Sar Betamuz to Tisha Be'av, this period that we just spoke about tonight, that's called Ben HaMetzarim, is going to be one big holiday. One huge long holiday. It's going to start in Shiva Asar Betamuz, up until Tisha B'Av is going to be one big Chola Moed, and one of the biggest holidays that's going to eclipse all holidays that we celebrate now is going to be Tisha B'Av. It's a day that's going to turn. We said from the biggest darkness comes the biggest light, and that's on Tisha B'Av. That's when Mashiach is going to be here. You know, I don't want to... There's so much more I could mention. And you know what? Let's leave some for some of the other lessons that we have coming up. But I'll just say this. There's a big tikkun during these days. We'll conclude with this. If you're tuned in, if you're focused, if you're plugged in, you can have an incredible spiritual elevation starting tonight. Starting tonight. Do tikkun chatzot. Sit with yourself for a minute. Just start flipping through pages and look at that wall and see if it moves something. I dare yourself to go and see some of the gory pictures that are out there of Jewish history and what has happened to us since the time that Bet HaMikdash is now with us. However, if we're tuned in and if we're plugged in collectively, we can fix the world. You know, the Jews are the handyman of the world. We know that the world is broken. We know that it's our job to fix it. That's why we have all the gadgets and all the high tech and all the Nobel Peace Prizes. Why? Because we know we're here to fix. So we invent things to fix. Yeah, the rest of the world is going to benefit from it as well. But we know that. We invent things because the world needs fixing. At Kama Vekama on a spiritual level. We can bring things back to the way they used to be. To a beautiful Jewish utopia. We can bring Mashiach. Not this madhouse circus that we live in. I don't need to go into detail. The world is not what it used to be. And I'm young. Not an old guy that's saying this. Take a 60 year old, 70 year old. They're walking around with their eyes open like what happened to the world? It used to be, it used to be normal. Speak to a 60 year old. Speak to an 80 year old. 80 year old probably won't leave the house. Because he doesn't want to use his car, he doesn't want to use a cell phone. They're, they're scared to be out there. Don't you want a life with no cancer? Don't you want a life with no diseases? Don't you want a life where everyone is healthy? Everyone is wealthy? Everyone is happy? Don't you want to have a purposeful life? Don't you want to know what life is about? Don't you want to walk around being figured out? Instead of a question mark walking through life, who am I, what am I, what am I going to do, what's good, what's bad? Don't you want to live with God in your life? Do you even know what that means? I don't even know what that means, but I know I want it. I know that's where it's at. 
Don't you want to be connected to eternal life? What if I told you that there is more after this? There's more. There's more. How much more? Never ending more. Don't you want to be a part of that? Are you really just going to tap out here after 120 years? I'm just going to fail here and leave me here. Don't you want to go all the way forever and ever with God? We have a chance to inch closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and inch closer to the Geula during these months, during these days. And the way that we do it, the way that we really do it, is just to do the complete opposite of what was done during these years. You have to do the complete opposite. If before we had Sinat Chinam, and that's all we have to say, that you're hating another person, or don't want to connect to another person. Why? For no good reason. You know, as a Jew, we are obligated to connect. We are obligated. It's a mitzvah to talk to another Jew, to do mitzvah with another Jew, to learn with another Jew, to eat with another Jew. It's a mitzvah. By not interacting with another Jew, you're sinning. Hashem didn't put us into this world so we'll be hermits at home. He built this whole beautiful world so we can interact in it. He wants us to go out and play. He wants us to interact in this world and with each other. You know, during these months, I'm sorry, during these days, we have to activate the love thy neighbor. And the love thy neighbor, it's not your next door neighbor. Your neighbor is your wife. Your neighbor is your child. Your neighbor is your in law, your friends the people in shul, the people that you talk to and the people that you don't talk to. It's time to be a good guy. It's okay to say hello. It's okay to do a favor. It's okay to be a good Jew. It's actually cool nowadays to be a good Jew. It's not like it used to be. Soon people are going to be mitihadim. You know, in, in Hanukkah they had what? Mitiavnim. They wanted to become Greek. Soon when Mashiach comes, you know what's going to happen? Everyone, all the goyim are going to put on tzitzit, they're going to grow up their peot, they're going to be mitiyahadim. They're going to say, oh, we're the Jews, it's like the hottest thing, we want to be it. We're like, no, it's not a fad, it's not a trend, you can't get in, it's over, you had your chance. They'll be mitiyahadim. The secret of the Jew is unity. The secret of the Jewish success is Ahdut Am Yisrael. You know, the rabbis tell us that when Shiva Asar Betamuz lands on Shabbat and we need to push it off to Sunday, and Tisha Be'av lands on Shabbat and we push it off to Sunday, there's a big, big chance of Mashiach coming. And guess what this year? It is. It is. What's the chance that that's that happening? So what are you going to do? Are you going to do your part? Just do your part. You never know. Maybe you're going to bring Mashiach. Maybe you're the one that broke the, sh- broke the straw, I broke the camel's back, the straw that broke the camel's back. How do you know? Just do your part and don't worry. Hashem is keeping notes. I saw your effort. Don't worry. I got you. Even if it doesn't come. But Bezat Hashem, it will come. We have, a, we have a segula. The rabbis don't pull out a rabbit out of the hat. Oh, you know, if this happens on a Sunday, Mashiach is coming. There's sources for this. Be'ezat Hashem, that we merit to have Ahavat Am Yisrael. To be a united nations of brothers and sisters. To, that we will merit to see Yerushalayim built out again. That beautiful vision. And to have the centerpiece of Yerushalayim, Bet HaMikdash, right there in the middle, built out. Be'ezat Hashem that we can give Nachat to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know, by the way, if you ever want to upgrade your service to God, you should come from one place. Is what I'm doing giving Nachat to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Is HaKadosh Baruch Hu sitting back and saying, Ah, that's my son. Ah, look at my daughter. It's not, I think I did mitzvah. Ah, 
Okay, we prayed. You think that gives nachat Hakadosh Baruch Hu? In your service, see if you can activate God's heart with your service. Are you giving nachat to Hakadosh Baruch Hu? And that Be'ezat Hashem will give Hashem nachat so He can come back to His home. Kivyachol, His home. The whole world is His home. But to where? To Yerushalayim. To where? Bet HaMikdash. To where? Kodesh HaKodeshim. Why? So the Shekhinah can lay right there. You know what it's like to live in a world where the Shekhinah is in it? It's all good all the time. We have no clue. We have no clue. It's not here. We've never experienced it. We are an orphaned generation. All I can tell you is that we miss you, Hashem. And we miss that you were living in Yerushalayim and we were right there with you. That's a message I'd send up to God right now. You should cast your heart to Yerushalayim and yearn for its build out. So one day, you can be there to merit, to be part of that monumental, that momentous and awesome occasion when Hashem is there, the Bet HaMikdash is there, the Mashiach is there, all Am Yisrael is there, and you're there too. You want to be part of that club. Hashem Varech Otchem, Misamech Otchem, and the Bezat Hashem, I see all of you in the built out Yerushalayim, in the time of Bet HaMikdash, with Mashiach. Now, right now, we're, I got room in my car. Who's coming with me? Hashem, Varech Otchem, Misamech Otchem, Shitu Libechem, Lechem, Pasasagur, Mazayim, Matsabur, Doachem.